What a humbling experience to stand here before you this evening for this service of remembrance and celebration. Back 41 years ago, it was June 17, 1973, when I was ordained a deacon. It was my first time to experience this service. I can remember not knowing anyone whose name was read, but even then I was stuck by what it means to be a connected church. Here were people who made a great difference in the lives of people, not mine directly, but in the lives of countless former EUB and Methodist churches, and people connected together by the history of Otterbein and Bame, Asbury, Coke, Albright, the Wesley brothers. From that time on, I had a keen awareness of what it means to be a connectional church connected as pastors, as spouses, as laity, we are knit together as part of the body of Christ. For me, this service tonight, along with ordination, reminds us over and over of our connectedness. As the years have quickly rolled by, more and more names on the list have not only been familiar, but they've been colleagues that I have known. Mentors that have walked with me have shared their journey with me. Some names have been good friends whom I still long to see and laugh with and talk with. And now tonight, names that I have known through much of my ministry. Some I've had the privilege of serving as their district superintendent, one who was on the board of ordained ministry and read my sermon for ordination. And by his grace and the grace of God, I was still ordained. <laughs> one who was elected bishop the year I graduated from high school and the year the United Methodist Church was born. One who served the conference office. Spouses that I have sat and talked with about their dedication in ministry and serving in ways that have brought people to know Jesus Christ. And all of them has help, have helped to transform lives. I thank God for this service and the immense privilege of preaching this night. Will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth, but the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And, O oh God, in these moments, if I stumble or if what I say does not make sense, may people know that that is me speaking. And yet, O oh God, if in these moments your words creep out or something happens in this service that brings us comfort or hope or challenges us, May we give thanks to you because that's not me, but it's you. In your name we pray. Amen. I love reading old magazines and old newspapers. I find the writing in those from the 18 and early 1900s interesting. Sometimes strange, but they give us a glimpse of a life of a time long ago a time so different from ours. One of my favorite things to read in old newspapers are the obituaries. The writer of those columns didn't just write the facts. Born, died, family names, they talked about the person. Sometimes they even included the will in the obituary. One such obituary I found was written December 4th, 1885. It says, Mrs. Flint died suddenly about half past four on Friday. After he eating a hearty supper on the day before mentioned, she went the back to the backyard to look at the pigs, one of which was unwell. And when a few steps from the hog pen, as she was returning to her house, the old lady fell. A man was passing by the alley and went to her assistance, helping her up. She said she could walk by herself. 
She had not gone but a few steps, however, when she sank to the ground, never to rise again, expiring without a word. The writer and that obituary made for good reading, but made a horrible theological statement, never to rise again. Our lives would be meaningless if we believed those words, that when we die, we will never rise again. If those words were true, this memorial service would be just that, a time to simply remember people who have died and are no more. But that's not what we believe. That is not what we know to be true, and that's not what we proclaim. Our faith history, our life, the lives of the people we remember and celebrate this night didn't believe that. They lived with the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, whether they were a spouse, a pastor, a spouse of a bishop, a bishop, a lay member to annual conference. They lived, breathed, and proclaimed the resurrection. They knew that in faithfulness of this life, God would be faithful in the time of their death. Just as God said to Ezekiel, see these dry bones? They will live, and they did. Just as Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, just as that tomb was empty on that first Easter morning, we come this night to celebrate that God has the power, the ability, and the love of God's children to raise them to new life. That's what the 40 people we remember this night lived and breathed and proclaimed. There is new life because our God is a God of power, a God of might, and a God who loves those whom God has created. Transformational leaders live in the promise and the certainty of God's word for eternal life. Transformational leaders can live courageously and selflessly every day in their ministry because that they know that their whole being comes from the God who created them, and it's that God who loves them that will call them back home to live with their creator forever. I love the Joshua passage that Rebecca read. Moses was a transformational leader. He was a sinner. He was a murderer. And he was a transformational leader. And he called up another transformational leader. Well, God did when God chose Joshua. But Deuteronomy 34, 9 says, Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hand upon him. I would add that Joshua was full of wisdom because Moses walked with him. Moses talked with him, helped him to learn to be a transformational leader. That's what transformational leaders do. They work with others. How many leaders, how many converts, how many disciples have these 40 people on our list tapped and said, God has a plan for you? How many lives have been transformed and how many people have come to discover God's plan because of the leadership of these persons whom we remember and celebrate tonight. Joshua didn't want to be a leader, but Moses and God walked with him, worked with him, and when Moses died, I love this line. God said to Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. Now, I think the Old Testament writer cleaned this up because I can hear Mo uh, Joshua saying, no, duh, God, tell me something I don't know. I didn't want to be in this position. What do I do now? I don't want this job. I don't want this ministry. What am I to do? Moses and you raised me up. Now what's going to happen? Sound familiar? In our pain and sadness at losing a loved one, we feel like we just can't go on that we can't put one foot in front of the other. We feel as though sometimes life just isn't worth living. But remember what God said to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 2. Now proceed to cross to the Jordan. It's as if God is saying what would later be written in Psalm 30. Weeping may tarry for a night, but joy will come in the morning. 
another version, the RSV version, the revised Salzgiver version, would say, weeping and confusion may last a bit, but with transformational leaders, God will wipe away your tears and show you your next ministry field. God goes on to remind and comfort Joshua by saying in verse 6, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Again in verse 7, only be strong and courageous. And then again in verse 8, I hereby command you, be strong, courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do we get this message? Three different times in four verses, God is reminding Joshua, as the bishop reminded us this afternoon when he talked about Esther. Esther and Joshua are alike because God is saying, I have called you, Esther. I have called you, Joshua. I have called each one of you for such a time as this. It is for us to understand that God has raised us up. And when God raises us up, there is nothing for us to fear or to be afraid. We proclaim that promise even when we read, even though I walk through the darkest shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Eugene Peterson in Psalm 23 says it this way, you have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and you send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. The last part of verse 6 says, I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Transformational leaders in their life call us and show us the way, but in their death they expect us to keep going on that path. They are reminding us that when they walk this path, even the path of Death Valley, just as they have trusted the God who claimed them, who called them and nurtured them, it's the same God whom they trusted in their last weeks and in their last days and hours and moments of their life. It is that God who called them by name, the same God who opened the gates of heaven and said, come home, my child, you have done well. Now come rest from your labors. That place of rest is a place where there is no pain or sorrow, no crying, there is no dementia, no cancer, no sorrow at a body weakened by age or disease. It's a place where the young and the old together discover a new life. It's where the saints, beyond all else, they realize they are home with their God. These 40 people that we remember this night all prepared to find their way home to God. They lived, they preached, they taught, they shared that our God is always a God who calls us home. They proclaimed, they shared, and they showed that God has prepared a home for all people. Over and over, in the ministry of those 40 people, they helped lead people home. How many times did they talk? Did they pray? Did they hold hands? Put their arms around people who did not nor could not find their way home. Last year at this memorial service, Dr. Kathy Kind, Superintendent Altoona, did a great job of preaching. Now, I knew that the bishop had already asked me to preach this year, and I was beginning to think of some things, and as Kathy was preaching, she said, I want to tell you a story about Anne Lamont. And as she talked about Anne Lamont, I wanted to yell, Kathy, no, I'm planning to use that story next year. <laughs> well, as she told the story, thanks be to God, it was not the one I was going to use. So hear these words that come from 
her book, Anne Lamont's book, Traveling Mercies. She says, we got a new pastor named Veronica. One day she told us a story about when she was seven years old, her best friend got lost. The little girl ran up and down the streets of that big town where they lived. She couldn't find a single landmark. She was so frightened. And finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of his car and they drove around until they finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman and then she told him firmly, you can let me out now. This is my church and I can always find my way home from my church. Those persons listed tonight Some claim their ministry in the church as a pastor. Others worked in extension ministries. One was a bishop, spouses, a lay member of the annual conference. Some preached, but some didn't preach in the pulpit, but took every opportunity to help people find their home. These folks and the folks of us who have gathered here know that when we lose our way, when we can't find our direction, when we have lost our path, all we need to do is find church, and we can always find our way home. Transformational leaders point people how to go home, and when people get lost and can't find home, transformational leaders show them by their lives and sometimes by their words where home is. Once the saints of God get to the eternal home that is with God, they become our loudest clearing, cheering section. They are cheering us on, on, supporting us. The word of Hebrews is absolutely true. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Forty more witnesses are cheering us on. A former colleague of mine when I worked at the General Board of Discipleship told this story that when he was little and he would go to visit his grandparents, they had an outhouse. And that outhouse wasn't very close to the house. In fact, it was far down a path. At night, he says, he was always afraid to go to the outhouse, even though he had a lantern to lead his way. But he would tell how his grandmother would stand at the door. And she would keep telling him, it's okay, go on. I can see you, it's okay. He heard her encouraging words all along the way. Even he said when he shut the door and even though he had the lantern with him, he could still hear her. It's okay, I'm here, I'm watching you. Every time I told my mother that our family was coming to visit, even though we lived sometimes just an hour or two hours away, she would ask, well, what time are you coming? And every time from the time I was first married until I was 60 and we moved our parents into an assisted living, when our family or even I would come by myself and pull into the driveway, mom was always standing at the door. It was that encouragement of knowing that she was waiting for us cheering for our safety, but really saying, welcome home. We who are here are able to make disciples. We are able to transform the world. We are able to do new and different kinds of ministry because of the saints who have gone before us. Those saints are now cheering us on. They're applauding us, but I also believe they're challenging us. They were the church, some in a very different time but they now see clearly. And they are calling from the sidelines, go on, it'll be a new day. It is a new day. It's a new day, try new things. Raise up new leaders. Be the church of the 21st century, not the church of the 19th century. They are reminding us that we can do it, that we can be the church of today and tomorrow because they have paved the way. We don't see them anymore, and it's painful. But they've shown us the way. They have been our guide. They have been our inspiration. And they're expecting us 
to continue to be transformational leaders that they've called us to be. They expect, support, and demand us to be in new ministries for today and tomorrow, to reach out, to get out of our pews, join hands with those who maybe never come inside the doors, people we don't know, people who don't know how to find their way home. It's because of the saints that we can move forward. There's a true story about a symphony. Now, this was before you had emergency lights and lighted exits. It was summer and they were playing. They were playing one of the best symphonies they had ever played. People were on the edge of their seats. And as that piece came to the best part and the crescendo started, there was lightning and thunder. There was a storm coming, but they continued to play. And all of a sudden, there was a loud clap of thunder, and the lights went out. It was just one second of silence. And the orchestra picked up right where they, finished, right where they stopped. They couldn't see the conductor. It was dark. But they continued to play. And they played the best concert. When the lights came back on, the conductor was still there in his place, conducting. Someone asked the conductor, how could they do that without seeing him? And he said, well, we've practiced for this day. And they knew that even though they couldn't see me, they knew I was there. They knew I had my baton and I was directing them and my toe was tapping. He said they knew I was there and I would be conducting till the end of the piece. He said, that's what we practice for, and that's what I do as a conductor. As God led and conducted the saints, so God is calling and leading us to the mission and ministry that God calls us to. The saints cheer us, and God expects us to raise up new transformational leaders, just like those saints raised us up. And even as God has raised up those 40 saints into life eternal, even though we can't physically see the saints any longer, we are reminded by God to proceed into the future. Do not be afraid. Be courageous. Be strong. And do not be frightened because God is leading us into a new tomorrow. And with the Apostle Paul, all we can do is set our direction to tomorrow and proclaim, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our life with Jesus Christ. Amen.